Uh-huh. And I want, for the record, to state, I haven't bought a new guitar in... Four weeks. Eight weeks. So Brian will have lapped me at this point. Go to the store. Why? Yeah, let's go stop that being built yet. Go to the store. You're not supposed to figure that out. What do I do with my microphone? I watch that store regularly. Is it sitting down there somewhere? He's got it. I did right. that first. Uh, offering is back there. Please mark off your name. We're putting a pause on the. Uh, VBS event, maybe we can do it in August, but who the heck are we kidding? The world is weird enough as is. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, the kingdom of God is going forward anyway. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So, everybody look at your neighbor and say, hold on tight. Hang on. Hold on, tight. Hang on, brothers. Today is going... I'm losing everything today. If you see my mind anywhere, let me know. Uh... into prayer, Jesus style, blue than the red, white, and blue, ooh, ooh. Anybody remember Love America style? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Come on. Yeah. Well, I was the only person who remembered Love America. Actually, I'd probably be okay if I was the only person. <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, Fridays at noon, Kent, is this an ongoing thing? Fridays at noon, there's a prayer time at the Red Wagon. Oh, Red okay. Wagon. Yeah, praying for our country uh, downtown. Fridays at noon. Prayer time at the Red Wagon, uh, and this will be going on till until further notice. Exactly. So this thing is gone. Amen. Um, so today, after I talked about the Lord's Prayer last week, I really picked up some things that I that I want to add in there that has to do with the context of the Lord's Prayer within the Sermon on the Mount. You remember the three C's: context, conflict, conclusions. Can you tell which one we're talking about today? talking about the context. I'm going to give you this overarching picture of the second two thirds, uh, really the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, because I want you to see where the Lord's Prayer fits in the big picture of what Jesus is trying to teach, because it's kind of mind-boggling. Okay? Now, prepare yourself. We're going to go over probably some of the most controversial things Jesus said. Okay? And I'm glad Max loves to go over controversial yeah, yeah, yeah. issues. <laughs> All right, so here's what Jesus has just talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. That he is the new standard of righteousness. Now, if you have been Jewish and you have grown up your entire life memorizing the Old Testament, and you hear a teacher saying that he is now the new standard of what righteousness looks like, can you understand that that's not just offensive, that's blasphemous? Yes. Yes. And what you're going to hear in the Lord in, in the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus frequently say, you have heard, and he'll say something, and then what's that last little phrase he throws in? But I say to you. Yes. Folks, if you grew up in the church, you're used to this. If you grew up as a Jewish person following Jesus, coming to hear this young guy teach, you cannot overestimate how offensive maybe even blasphemous, Jesus teaching this would be. Who do you think you are trying to undo Moses? Who do you think you are trying to undo what we have learned for 4,000 years? We know who you are. Your father was a day laborer, and he might have knocked up your mom. Hey. Right? Okay? So now he says anger and lust are not just things you do, but they start in your heart. Yeah. And every man, when you see the line, if you've had lust in your heart for a woman you've already committed adultery with her, has all said, oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. And every human, when Jesus says, if you are just angry with your brother, Forget doing something. If you're just angry in your heart, you've already committed murder. And everybody, especially parents, everybody says, oh, no. Hello? Come on. Wow. Especially parents. Well, maybe me. Maybe you. Have it. <laughs> and then he goes so far to say that fighting back is not the proof of power. And here's where it gets really quiet. 
So he says, if the Roman guards make you carry their equipment for a mile, what do you do? Carry two. Carry two. Carry two. You show them. You may have some kind of authority over me. But God's truly who I'm submitted to. So you want me to carry it a mile? Watch me carry it too. Somebody backhands you. Because remember, if you get slapped on the right side of the cheek by a right-handed person, they didn't just hit you, they backhanded you. What do you do? Give them the other cheek. Give them the other cheek. Right? Mm -hmm. Tell them this side's jealous. I mean, don't we live with this sense that, that self-protection is the most innate thing on the planet? Yeah. Isn't that kind of inborn in all of us? My job is to protect mama's baby. <laughs> and so he's, he goes as far as to say fighting back is no longer proof of power. And then he goes on to say things about adultery and taking vengeance and making false vows. But then Jesus says the thing that rips the needle off the record. Right there. Tips over the jukebox. Drops that I just date my, Drops the mic. <laughs> kicks the mic. <laughs> he says, you've heard it said... Love your neighbors and hate your enemies. Now, Old Testament people, where in the Old Testament does it say hate your enemies? I'll wait, because it never says it. Deuteronomy says love your neighbors. But what Jesus is doing is he knows these people and he knows what they grew up with. Rabbis would add to the conversation. Love your neighbors and hate your enemies. Because who the heck are we kidding? These people grew up. Watching their, they're learning the stories about their heroes. Anybody remember the mighty men of David? Yes. Did any of them turn the other cheek? No, never. No. <laughs> he killed 8,000. He fought for eight hours. He killed a lion. I mean, but what does Jesus say? Love your enemies. And pray for those who despitefully you. Despitefully you hurt you. Don't get mad at me. I'm just reading what he said. Yeah. Here's the part you got to get. These people now don't know what to make of Jesus. Okay? And here's what you have to understand. Is it safe to say that right now people aren't too thrilled with Christian moral teachings on sexual behavior and what people should do with their genitals? Absolutely. Yes. Is that fair to say that people aren't thrilled with that right now? Yes. Okay. But for all of human history, since the moment Jesus ascended, that is the thought that has kept people from becoming Christians. What do you mean I have to love my enemies? Don't you know what they did to me? Okay? So right now, this is the first part Jesus talks about. Then he goes a step further. And he's going to list some things. And I want you to listen. Because some things are going to be internal. Some things are going to be external. Some things are going to be man-focused. Some things are going to be God-focused. And either to help or to confuse, you pick. I color-coded everything. <laughs> Thank you, and I'm sorry, in advance. <laughs> Underlined is the concept that God wants to bless you. In red is going to be either God or man. Give, uh, even bold is the activity listed. And then highlighted is what Jesus wants you to do. Good, Give me man. a second. Thank you. Yeah. It only took me three days. <laughs> <laughs> Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, now, he doesn't say don't practice, don't do righteous things. He had just said... 15 minutes earlier, let your light so shine before men that all men will see your good works and glorify God. So this isn't an issue of whether you do the right thing or not. Fair? Sure. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Two thoughts. This idea that we serve God because he rewards us makes your ears bristle, doesn't it? Right. And the reason it makes your ears bristle is because of tele televangelists, and frankly, it should. They completely miss the boat. Blessed of God means I have so much, I can't stop giving to other people. Okay, blessed of God does not mean accumulating. Blessed of God means you just keep getting and you keep giving it out. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Okay. But remember, this is Jesus. This is not TBN. 
Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So you see in red, them and Father. So when you, it doesn't say if you. It says when. It says when you, so you will. give to the poor. Do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. So what Jesus is saying is these people are just doing what everybody normally does. This is just accepted. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. If people agree with you, if people bless you, if people say, wow, that was generous, God's saying, that wasn't what it's about. But, everybody say, but. but. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, you're just, you're just giving so freely and you're just giving so openly, one hand doesn't know what the other one's doing. So that... Your giving will be in secret, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now here's the part I want you to get. Notice at the end of verse 6, and notice at the end of verse, I'm sorry, chapter 6, verse 1, and then notice at the end of verse 3, what is Jesus like? The blessing too. A good father. Yeah. Now, here's what you have to understand. If you grew up in the church, you're used to the concept of Father God, and we are very grateful for this. But if you grew up Jewish in Jesus' era, and you heard Jesus say God and Father in the same breath, you know what you're wondering? Where's the rock? We should stone this guy. Remember in John, they said we were killing him because he called God his Father, thereby making himself equal with God? Do you know how many times in the Old Testament God is called Father? Three. And each time it's by analogy. Okay? We've seen Jesus call God Father probably 12 times already by this verse. The concept of a loving God who interacts with people and who is personal is a Christian concept. It's not a Jewish concept. It is not an Old Covenant concept, friends. And if you have people who, who want to go back to the Old Testament Jewish roots... Okay, but you got to understand something. Father God is not an old covenant concept. Okay, by the way, so is heaven. Heaven is not an old testament concept. And let me just give you a quick clarification. Oh, two. All right, no wait. Shoot, I forgot. Here's your here's your disclaimer. Look at your neighbor and say, "Here's your disclaimer." Here it is. Here it is. The Sermon on the Mount is for individual disciples. It's not a system of government. Okay? If, if I get my car stolen, I can forgive the person who stole it. You all, as society, can't. Does that make sense? If somebody slaps me, I can forgive them. If Post Falls invades Spokane with guns, and armor, we collectively don't have to turn the other cheek. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Here's the other part. If you are discipling someone, it's okay to tell them about your financial life and how you give. My grandfather, every time he gave me a dollar, he gave me a dollar and a dime. Can you guess why? He wanted to teach me how to tithe. If you're discipling someone, it's perfectly fine to say, like in my case, I used to tithe on net, now I tithe on gross. I'm not saying this to get any recognition from anybody, but because my job is to disciple you, does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, all right, so then he goes on. Verse 5, when you pray, not if you pray. You are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street so that they may be seen by men. He's not discouraging public prayer. He's just saying, your heart position is not to be, look at me. Yeah. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Have you heard this before? Yes. When? Last slide. <laughs> but you, when you pray, not if, 
Go into your inner room, and if that's not enough, close the door. And pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You kill your bears and your lions in private so that you can kill your Goliath in public. Yes. Hey, that's good. Well, thank you. Yes. I should quit good. right now, shouldn't I? <laughs> Good. Yeah. Do, do, do you want to know why I think America's having such a hard time praying this thing into death, this, this virus into death? It's because we as American Christians have stopped having a private inner life just between you and Jesus. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mono e theo. Yes. Other yeah. parties are not very unified in the church. We have religion, not relationship. We have religion, we have a relationship. We have churchianity. We yeah. don't have an entire part of our life that's just between you and Jesus. Come on. Verse 7. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Now, let me clarify something. Meaningless repetition is more like a chant mm -hmm. or an incantation. They believed you would wear down a god. You would either bribe it with whatever it wants, which is where child sacrifice comes from, folks. You, you would sacrifice your child because you think that would get the god to move. Or they believed you would wear down the god. If you needed a new car, I need a new car, I need a new car, I need a new car. I need... That's what they're referring to. They are not referring to sustaining until you prevail in prayer. A lot of people pray prayers. Jesus wants us to prevail in prayer. Ask and keep asking. Seek or knock and keep knocking. Seek and keep seeking. Does that make sense? Yes. This has to do with some kind of false belief that if you just say something enough. Okay. Verse 16. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do for they, will, for they neglect their parents so they will be noticed by men when they are fasting, truly I say, are you seeing where the, are, have you already pretty much memorized where this is going? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's contrasting having the public approval and public uh, recognition <laughs> with having an absolute raw dependence on God. Because you go back to the earlier concepts, what is he pointing to? Having a raw, naked dependence on God. God, if you don't come through, I don't know what I'm going to do. Is that making sense? Because mm -hmm. he's trying to contrast this. And in verse 18, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Friends, God wants to bless you. We're not trying to coax blessings from God like he's sitting there angry and bitter about something. But we have to understand there's always going to be this, this fight between getting the approval of people and the approval of God. Amen. Now let me just ask you really quick. Did I make a... Or did I? Did Jesus make a very compelling case about having approval from God versus having approval from men? Yes. Yes. Would you agree that it's binary? He doesn't give you a third option. Right? Well, watch where he goes next. Do not store up. So you're going to see exclamation points. This means that in Greek, it's in the uh, command tense. In English, we use punctuation. In Greek, they change the way the word sounds. So you're going to see these because these are actual commands Jesus is giving. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. But store up. So he's not saying you don't live a life where you, you make progress. He's not saying that at all. He's just saying, once again, don't do what everybody's doing. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the verse that prompts, you, you probably heard me say, if you want to know where your idols are, what do you daydream about? Remember, I've said that a few times before. Well, that's the verse that's putting this. Whatever is the deepest part in your heart is probably where your idols lie. 
Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So when your eye is clear, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. This is, again, the scriptural reference I use for when I go and I open up the blinds versus close, your, right. close the blinds. Right. Jesus isn't saying it's an issue with the sun. It's not an issue with light. It's an issue with how are you perceiving it. The next thing he's going to say is, and if the light in you is darkness... How terrifying is that darkness? If what you think is right is actually wrong in the eyes of Jesus, that's a terrifying place to be. Yeah. Anybody here have somebody in your life who's completely convinced they're going the right way, and you just go, oh, brother, yeah. you're, you're, you're digging a hole and you're just digging faster. <laughs> Hello? Not that any of us have ever been there. <laughs> and then once again, no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and wealth. What did Jesus just finish saying? You can't get the flip. You can't please God if you're desperately trying to please people. Now what is he saying? He's saying you cannot serve God and wealth. What are the two forces on this planet that most mimic the power of God? Money, popularity. Right? Mm -hmm. That's why you have TV shows like Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. You don't have Lifestyles of the Poor and Obscure. <laughs> right? You look at them and they have enough money, they have enough fame to get whatever they want. Jesus is saying, that's not what God has for you. Oh, and clarify something. Not everything in Christianity is black and white. The reason there are a lot of churches, the reason there are a lot of denominations is because God's character is full and it's vast and there's lots of, like facets in a diamond, there's lots of facets in it. The reason we have lots of different churches and different denominations is they each emphasize a different part of God's character. Okay, Not everything in Christianity is black and white. All right? Some things are. You can't simultaneously be an atheist and a Christian. Okay? That's right. We're not saying everything's black and white. We don't have to agree on everything. Verse 25, do not be worried. Again, a command about what you will eat, what you will drink, nor what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body, of body more than clothing? So look at 25 at the beginning. What is he now applying this to? Worry, anxiety, fear. Yes. Okay. Verse 30, but if God so clothes, clothes the grass of the field which is alive to make today and tomorrow is thrown in the furnace, how, will he not much more clothe you? What is he pointing to? God is a loving provider. Amen. Now, look at how he ends the sentence. O ye of little faith. That was a little nickname that he threw around for the disciples. Quick side note. Everybody say simple. 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 But not easy. But not easy. Simple. simple. But not easy. You watch a cooking show on, on the cooking channel, and they make it look very simple. Oh, well, you just have these ingredients, so you just stir and you just follow the recipe, but that doesn't mean it's easy. easy. I was teaching somebody to golf the other day, and I said, golf is just returning your hand from here back to here. That's all golf is. Back. For that, that's all it is, whether it's a putt, whether it's a chip, whether it's a full, it's just returning your hand to here. That's all it is. Because it is. And that is simple, simple <laughs> but not. <laughs> and probably everybody in your career has something or two where everybody looks at it and goes, well, that's it. like me preaching. We're going, hey, anybody, but. You know what the best compliment was I ever got as a pastor? When I. When I had my church in Kirkland, and it was just 20 people under the age of probably 25, 20, well, 28. 
And a friend of mine who wanted to be a pastor showed up to one of our services. The greatest compliment I ever got as a pastor is after the whole service was over, he came up to me and goes, Sean, God spoke to me so clearly. I said, oh, great. And I'm thinking of something he said. And he goes, God told me to start a church. <laughs> and I said, awesome. And as he, did you just do the math? In other words, God said to him, if Sean can do it, Simple, <laughs> Christianity has gotten accused, and frequently rightfully so, of reducing fear, anxiety, and worry to just a lack of faith. We have made it sound simple, when in fact it's not easy. 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 Worry, anxiety, and fear are so difficult because you feel them in your body. And you feel them in your body in a way that is not fully rational. And so when somebody comes with simple or technically simplistic answers, we don't do a very good job of saying, yes, this is Simple. That doesn't mean it's always easy. easy. Yes, sir. I'm looking for head nods. Yes, sir. Right. Because when you're when you're talking with somebody who is battling, or you are personally battling, worry, anxiety, fear, anger, dread. Is the answer on some level increasing your faith and belief in the goodness of God? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. But you have decades of your body feeling worry, fear, and anxiety that isn't always very rational. Have you ever tried to explain something rational to someone who is not in a place to be rational? How well does that go? <laughs> now, now, track with me. Do you get out of it by adding some rationality to your thinking? Absolutely. Okay. You, you absolutely have to make this first. I, I am not what I think. The loudest voice in my head is never God. Those are rational statements. It doesn't mean they win quickly. This is why we say you have to change your relationship to anxiety while you change your thoughts of anxiety. You have to realize, just because it's in my brain does not mean it's me. Yes. Can you imagine what would happen to the racism issue in our world if people mm. learned, just because a thought's in my brain doesn't mean it's me? Yep. You don't have to say that. Yeah. I'll leave that there. Put that in a book. <laughs> um, so, here he goes. Verse 31. Do not worry. It's a command. Then saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He, he's not saying you don't ask. He's just saying you ask in a manner that says, I know you need it, but I need to come before you, and I need to state my dependence. Amen. Amen. Okay? And once again, do you see the Father heart there? This is why we talk about undoing your wrong concept of God, which frequently has to do with the wrong concept of your dad. Definitely has to do with the wrong concept of your parents. And every child, no matter how great their parents are, will deal with this. I fully expect Zachary and Alex to be on a couch someday talking about, you should have seen the dad I had. I don't doubt that. And I don't, I don't begrudge it. Okay. It's not an issue of blame. There's plenty of blame going around. How many of you know your grandparents were no fun to be raised by either? Right? Yeah. 
Verse 33, but seek, exclamation point. This is a commandment. First, his kingdom and his righteousness. And all, all these things will be added to you. Yes. What are all those things? What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Are you seeing this verse here? Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Folks, what is the context of that verse? Battling anxiety, worry, and fear. So this is why the Lord's Prayer, right in the middle, give us this day our daily bread, but also your kingdom come, your will be done. And how do we define this? His kingdom means usually not my comfort zone. My comfort zone is loud, it is sizable, it is vast, and has an opinion on every part of my life. <laughs> but if I'm seeking my, my comfort zone, my worry and anxiety, remember, American happiness is when your comfort zone is hit perfectly, but then it gets smaller. smaller. Christian joy is when you take the sides of your comfort zone and you so that you can be comfortable anywhere the comforter is, which means you carry him with you everywhere. That's the difference between happiness and joy. His kingdom, not my comfort. His righteousness means God's highest good in any situation. Don't look at that as do's and don'ts. Look at that as what would the best and highest thing that could happen out of this situation be. Okay? Um, and then he finishes up. Oh, wait a second. So the, the famous atheist Christopher Hutchins, mm. the author of The God Delusion and God is Not Great, said the key teaching of Jesus is this next verse. Do not worry for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself, and each day has enough trouble of its own. He interprets that to be, don't prepare, don't save, don't plan, just live with a mindless uh, naivete. Okay. Let me tell you why that's 100% incorrect. It's called the book of Proverbs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. What does the book of Proverbs, which is all about wisdom, what is it talking about? Mm -hmm. Planning ahead. Preparing. 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 Not being taken off, not, not being obsessed with money, certainly. Okay, so the summation of Jesus' teaching is that verse. Seek first the kingdom. Okay. But he finishes, do not worry, exclamation point about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. How many of you can say amen to that very loudly? Come on. <laughs> and so I sum it up like this. How do you know when you're in God's will? How do you make sure you're doing your best and getting where you want to go? Very simple. Do today well. Yeah. Amen. I guarantee you, if you're in God's will today, it's going to be easier for you to be in God's will tomorrow. Yep. Okay. And if you're in God's will today, it's going to be very hard to make disastrous choices. In fact, if a lot of you probably, if you've talked with me before about different situations in your life or different options you have, one of the things that I always come back to is start with getting as grateful as you can. Start with the assumption, I can't make a bad choice. Start with the assumption, God is going to bless me everywhere I go. Where does that come from? It comes from a confidence that says, because I am seeking, seeking first his kingdom, I can be confident that if I'm doing today as well, what does that mean? Being in the word, being in prayer, being in worship, investing in the lives of the people around you, looking at every interaction, every conversation. You can have it, if I can do today as well, today well. Now, if you come to me for one-on-one -on -one counseling, guess what I absolutely am going to talk about? Seeking the kingdom. Seeking first the kingdom. If you come to me for marriage counseling, I guarantee guess what I'm going to talk about. Seeking, the Seeking first his kingdom. The number of times I've come for, for, for a couple counseling, and we've, we've gotten done, and they say, oh, 
I feel, thank you, this feels so great. When can we talk again? And I say, after you've been in church five weeks in a row. Come on. <laughs> There's not going to be much that I say with you sitting on the couch that's going to be that much different than you sitting here in chairs. Right. That's right. That is very yes. <laughs> And by the way, haven't I made that nice and simple for once? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So to sum up, Jesus talks about our greatest hindrance is anxiety. He talks about our greatest need is being able to agree with him. Even when you look powerless and even when you look stupid. When people were looking at Jesus on the cross, do you think they were standing there saying, Oh, finally, the sacrificial lamb that's going to make atonement for our sins. No! What did everybody say? From the disciples, to the Sadducees, to the Pharisees, to the crowd, to the Romans, to the, to the other criminals. What did they all say in unison? Save yourself! You saved other people! Joshua would have killed everybody! Gideon would have killed everybody. God, smite somebody. Yeah. He did. Jesus. You can't make this stuff up. True. And then when your enemies are killing you, pray for them. Pray that God forgives the people killing you so you can spend all eternity with the people who murdered you. No human being would have ever come up with that for a religion. That's for sure. Anybody remember Joseph Campbell and what is it? The, help me, Caitlin, the hero with a thousand masks? So I thought, saying that all the religions are the same and it's all about the hero and how he delivers everybody from their enemies, but he just wears a different mask and he tries to link all the religions together. One problem with that, Jesus never killed his enemies. <laughs> he let his enemies kill him. No human being would create Christianity. Right? And what's our greatest assignment? Seeking first the kingdom. A couple thoughts. Seeking the kingdom agrees with Jesus and simultaneously suffocates anxiety. Amen. Amen. Simple. <laughs> Not always. Easy. We change our relationship to anxiety while we change our thoughts of anxiety. Okay. And I, this is a personal mantra of mine. The more I seek, the more he sends. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe me, stop seeking him. Yeah. Talk to me in six weeks. Mm -hmm. What? Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes you stop seeking God and the devil opens up doors that you were really hoping for. And you said, hey, I made the best. Anyone been there before? Anybody know somebody who's made some really stupid decisions and they go, I just have so much peace. Well, the reason you have peace is you stop fighting the spiritual battle. Yeah. You stop trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Folks, if, I, if my exercise regimen became walking on a treadmill while eating quarter pounders with cheese, <laughs> I would enjoy exercising more. <laughs> Big hot fudge Sunday while I'm on the treadmill. Huh? I would have peace. All right, you get that. Uh, and again, James says, uh, draw near unto God. He will draw near unto you. Okay? Seeking God first releases God's life in me and frees me from demanding the good life around me. This whole story comes down to do I want God's life or the good life? When you pursue God's life, guess what? You get the good life. You get the good life. Mm -hmm. When you pursue the good life, I think you get the stressed life. I think you get the addicted life. Yep. And by the way, friends, understand something. If you're struggling with financial issues, even if you had more money than you have right now, you would still struggle with financial issues. People who are very wealthy still struggle with financial issues because they usually employ people. Okay? That doesn't mean your financial issues go away. They change. 
and there certainly becomes a... Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. All right. And I'm going to conclude with this. Sunday to Starbucks. How do you take this content and share it with somebody who doesn't know Jesus yet? Here's a couple thoughts. Seeking happiness gets me addicted to whatever made me happy. Anybody here say that's true in their life? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Pursuing happiness is the absolute guarantee that you will never be happy. Because yep. you will never be happy enough. I used to work at I used to work at uh, Kachina Kachina in Kirkland on the waterfront. Absolutely the most beautiful place in the entire planet. And the thing I love the most were <laughs> you just know some guy spent two hundred thousand dollars on a very nice twenty-five foot yacht, and he was so happy, and he he got himself out of one of those lesser marinas. And he paid the big bucks to get in the Kirkland Marina. And he brings his nice 25-foot, $200,000 yacht. And he parks it next to the 634-foot, <laughs> $6 million. And the moment he pulls up into it, his, his, makes his look like a dinghy. Next to him, what does he say? Oh, that is what will make me happy. <laughs> Nope. Right. And it won't. <laughs> Second thing, wow. seeking Jesus improves my life and the lives of everyone around me. Now, your seeking Jesus might make some people unhappy with you, right. but that means they can't control you like they used to. That's right. But the more you seek Jesus is the more you're setting everybody up to make better decisions. And frankly, you're getting yourself out of their way. <laughs> yep. And the third one, I am free from anxiety to the degree I see God as my good father. Yeah. I, I wish I could say it any better. Amen. The moment you realize obedience, learning to agree with Jesus, with your time, with your talent, with your treasures, saying, God, how I, can I be more like you? is the key that opens up every door. And the thing that causes you to stumble, the thing that causes you to draw back, is usually at some point you aren't completely convinced God has your best at heart. How do I know that? I've been a strong Christian for 43 years. Years. <laughs> I would think I should be so much further down the road. I should be so much nicer. I should have so much of a consistently better attitude. It's been 43 years! <laughs> but what happens at the moment of truth? I may trust in the Lord, but boy, I really lean on my own understanding. Sometimes Jesus doesn't agree with me. Come on. Yeah. The more you're convinced in the goodness of God. When I'm sitting in front of a spouse who's ready to leave their spouse, and they're wondering, why should I give them one more chance? I always have to come back to it. And friends, understand, there certainly are times when you have to say, that I can't do this, I, I'm not going there. But just understand this. I, and even in one-on-one, -on -one, it, it comes down to, do you believe in the goodness of God? Because if you believe in the goodness of God, you can leave everything in his hands. Yep. If you believe mostly in the goodness of God, you leave it in his hands. You take it back. You take it back. You leave it in his hands. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. But it comes down to, at a very core level, do I believe he is a loving father who has my best heart? Yes. Can you see how completely radical the, the Sermon on the Mount is? Friends, how many of us want to walk in the resurrection power of God? Yes. Come on. Yes. Amen. Eight of you? Amen. How many of you, before God, how many of you want to walk in the resurrection power of God? Okay, Amen. ready? Ready? Yes. And yes, I'm setting you up. Okay. Yep. Sorry, and you're welcome. <laughs> what has to precede the resurrection power? Amen. A crucifixion. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try.
<laughs> Jesus, in your name, we are just grateful. And Lord, we want to walk in the resurrection power of God. So Lord, in your name, we will continue to choose to agree with you everywhere we go. We do not, we do not want to live powerless Christian lives. So in your name, give us wisdom, guidance. Help us seek more, because we know the more we seek, the more you said. And Jesus, we're just grateful for everything you're doing. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Tuesday night Bible study, Friday night prayer and worship. If you miss Friday night worship, you are missing the, excuse me, highlight of the week. And Wednesday night, we're back at youth group. Good to have Keith and Vicki back from the Midwest. And we'll see you later. Bye.